Skateboarding is like a bunch of sports combined. It's, it's, it's really uh, skating and surfing and sailing and kite flying all kind of mixed and jumbled together. You can ride waves, you can do freestyle tricks, anything a wakeboarder can do. You can make gigantic long and high jumps. It's, it's, it's amazing. You'll get a sensation like going up in a glass elevator on the side of a hotel building. It's just that, you see that feeling inside you, it's incredible. There's not many people that can do that and not get excited when they, when they get that feeling. And once you get it, you're hooked. It's something that I would encourage anybody to try, whatever age. You know, when I started kiteboarding, I thought this is one of the most dangerous, extreme sports that you could possibly do. The advancements in the product, you know, and the design of the kites and whatnot has made it a lot safer. Still dangerous, but it's a lot safer and a lot more accessible. And people are getting into this from kids uh, to 70-year-olds. It's the fastest growing water sport in the world and pretty much speaks for itself. The history of kites goes back thousands of years, but the story of kiteboarding begins with two French brothers, Dominic and Bruno Leganou. With my brother, we were always interested in uh, speed sailing, for example, all the, the kind of boats that were tested to reach the speed records. There was a, a boat which had a world speed record. It was a small catamaran with a stack of flexifoil kites and uh, his name was Jacob Slater. We were always looking for a new sail, more efficient, something like that. So finally we decided to, to make only one kite. We knew that when you want to make a big kite, you can't do it with a rigid frame because it becomes too heavy. So we thought that the only way was to make it inflatable. This revolutionary design meant that when the kite fell into the water, it floated and could easily be relaunched. The brothers tried to sell their invention to various sail manufacturers, but there were no takers. So we decided finally to make our own brand, with the name was Wipika. Laird Hamilton and Manu Bertin were a bit tired with windsurfing and they were looking for all the toys. Being a speed sailor, I became friends with Laird Hamilton, the American surfer. We would see some funny boats being powered by kites. Eventually, the idea of putting the kite on small tow boards clicked. So, they started to try kite surfing with sail kites. What happened then is that, of course, those kites were just made to, to play on the ground. And every time we would make a mistake, the kite was, would fall. And then suddenly it was uh, a nightmare situation because the kite would get uh, full of water, all the lines would get tangled. So you only had one shot. It wasn't until Manu read about Bruno's inflatable kite that he found the solution he'd been searching for. Not only that, but also he and the Legnus were from the same part of France. Once they connected, the sport as we now know it was born. We had a very hard time to develop this sport because uh, windsurfing was really at the top at this moment. We showed the kites in Maui and the brand started to, to consider the sport. I got into kiteboarding 
honestly when it was more of a novelty than a sport in the very early days and Maui was kind of the mecca epicenter for the development of it and it started out with uh, very basic Whippica inflated kites. It was the, the one brand in the world at that time that made two sizes of these inflated structured uh, traction kites. Most of us that were doing it at the time were windsurfers or ex-windsurfers or tow-in ex-windsurfer guys. I had the benefit of getting in on the ground floor of a couple of sports, one being windsurfing um, in the late 70s, the other one being uh, tow surfing um, in the mid 90s or early 90s let's say, and I saw what happened from the point of, hey, this is kind of fun, you know, this is a, you know, this might have potential to suddenly becoming an industry. I had the benefit of seeing that happen a couple of times. And uh, as soon as kite surfing came around, um, sort of by necessity, we had to build our own equipment. And it went from that point from, hey, this is kind of fun to, wow, this has got a lot of potential, you know? I mean, this has really the potential to become a sport and industry and, and uh, you know, being a, a legitimate thing. You know, once we got into it, people took a second look and went, wow, maybe it's something we should uh, have a look at. Very quickly, other manufacturers got involved and it's developed to the point where it is today with dozens of different manufacturers around the world and tens of thousands of people doing it. Coming from my windsurfing background, surfing background, the biggest appeal of kiteboarding has always been the jumping aspect. You know, just being able to get air and fly and, and boost. As soon as I was able to get air, and, and it was a direct comparison thing, obviously, to windsurfing. You'd get in the air on a kite board and you'd stay in the air. Whereas windsurfing, you'd get pretty good air, but gravity was always working against you. Whereas with kiting, you could launch off of a, a six inch chop and go 40 feet in the air and 100 feet downwind and stay up there for six seconds or longer. And that to me was like the, the instant attraction. Whenever a sport is invented, invariably competition soon follows, and kiteboarding was no exception. The first competition of kiteboarding that I ever saw was here in Maui, and it was uh, 1999 Red Bull uh, that saw kiteboarding as something, you know, a new sport that was interested for them. They decided to have a contest here. So they created this contest called the Red Bull King of the Air, which was basically about getting big jumps and doing tricks, but basically most of it was about doing high jumps. They invented this format, which was the big air format. And that's how contest started. You know, the judges on the beach were basically people that were kiteboarders and we just picked them up and they say, okay, you see how you know how high and you know you know how, how difficult is that. As contests evolved more, judges weren't as advanced as riders anymore. Riders started to become really specialized in doing tricks that nobody knew how hard those were. Basically we, we have to start getting the riders and the judges kind of in the same frame. Having meetings with the riders and explaining okay what, what's a harder trick than others and having judges really learn even though they, the judges are not able to perform these tricks at least they're able to identify them and see how hard they are as far as technical difficulty. Judged freestyle competition quickly emerged as the primary form of kiteboarding contests and the types of tricks evolved rapidly. As with any freestyle sport, judges' decisions are greatly influenced by the technical difficulty of the moves being performed. After big airs, which are relatively simple, came board offs and unhooked tricks such as handle passes. Additionally, power became a factor. The more powered up a rider is, the harder it is to pull off moves, and the more they're rewarded. As only kiteboarders could recognize the technical difficulty of tricks in their sport, in the winter of 2001, the prominent riders at the time formed an organization to act as the sanctioning body of kiteboarding competition at a professional level. And 2002 saw the first world tour of the Professional Kiteboard Riders Association, PKRA. First year we had uh, four events. We've been growing it ever since and uh, the price money is getting bigger, the competition is getting way harder. There's a whole bunch of new kids that are just ripping and riding really good. When I started out, most of the guys were nearly my age. Some were older, some were younger, but you know, obviously uh, more mature than, than they are today. It's gotten younger and younger and younger to where at the moment the average rider is about 18. 
and a lot of the good guys are 15, 16, 17 years old. So it's really become a young dynamic and young influence into the sport. I think it's a natural evolution in any sport that, you know, the, the guys that pioneer it, that evolve it, that set a standard and start developing the equipment and get it going are a bit older. And then as it becomes more viable and more acceptable to a younger crowd, especially a sport as, as accessible as kiteboarding, uh, it's very appealing to young people. You can learn and 12 months later, you're doing, you know, all the most rad tricks in the world. A year after that, you could be on the pro tour and, you know, making a living at it. That may sound hard to believe, but that's exactly what happened to Aaron Hadlow. I originally started kite surfing when I was 10, really. That's when I first fl started flying kites with my dad on the beach. I saw, you know, the first Whippaker, you know, the first uh, inflatable kite, and I saw this guy on the water. I thought, yeah, I've got to try this. Of course, being a kite and everything, uh, Aaron was, you know, he was quite interested in it. Kite surfing was the first proper main sport I really got into. I mean, when I was a kid, I would BMX, just play around on the beach, surfing a bit, and, but nothing serious. Then kite surfing came about, and it was a new sport. My dad was obviously doing it at the time, so I looked up to him to, to try and do that. Every day I could, I would get down the beach with him, fly his kite, try and jump in the water, have a go. After that, I just kept going. I loved the sport and just couldn't get enough of it. There was a, a pro competition in Cornwall. He entered, but there was no category, you know, because there was no kids then doing it, and it was just old guys. So he had to go in with the men, and he did very well. That winter we come to SI, South Africa, and, uh, and Aaron was fully into kiting then. That's where he met Jason Furness. Aaron came to South Africa where I have a house and have been going for many years to train and to test equipment. And uh, he came along with his parents, Ian and um, Louise, and I watched Aaron progress over the four months that he was there. Um, it was just insane. It was a kid that was just cat-like on the water. You just throw him on his board, he'd just be progressing. He'd see someone do something, he'd just run out on the beach, spend half an hour trained, do it. And he just had this ability of learning, had this ability to just, just progress and innovate the sport from day one. I saw this kid that was really, really ambitious to be the number one rider. I thought it could really, you know, be, it'd be a fantastic opportunity to set this kid up. Even though he was 12 years old, just to hook him up, look after him, and try and support him through it. Jason and Flexifoil sponsored Aaron, which allowed him to pursue a professional career full-time. Doing school from home, after a season on the British national circuit, Aaron went straight to the world tour. In 2004, he won the world championship while only 15 years old. And in 2005, he won it again. Looking back, if someone had told me at 15 I would be world champion, I'd be like, no, man, there's no way. In hell. Like, I always dreamed to become world champion. I always thought, yeah, one day it might happen. You never know. But I never thought it would come so soon. It just suddenly happened and it was just like, boom, there. And you're like, couldn't be any happier with how everything was going. We started filming Aaron at the start of the 2006 World Tour when he set out to retain his title for a third year in a row. We have witnessed the determination, focus and drive that it takes to stay at the top of a new and constantly evolving sport. With contenders from all over the world challenging Aaron's position, you'll see what it takes for him to maintain his supremacy. We've got so much stuff, like, we've got so much to pack, so... This is uh, the one ball bag with everything in, like most of my stuff, but... It's because there's so much, man, it's too heavy, it can't be above 32 kilos or... The baggage handlers won't take it, so that's 32, that one's maxed out. Now I'm on to the next one. Hopefully I have enough room for some clothes. <laughs> now, because I travel so much, I'm hardly ever back here in the UK. I'm always traveling around and just like back a couple of days and then off, off again, you know, I can wash my clothes and go back to the airport pretty much. So now I'm just off a few weeks early to Venezuela, just gonna go check the conditions a bit, just before the start of the World Cups. So I'm really looking forward to it and really want it to go well. I mean, three times world champion is like my goal this year. I just got to really be focused and just go for it.
Yeah, we're currently in Venezuela, Coche Island, just off Margarita, at the first event for 2006. I mean, there's flat water, good wind, probably one of the best conditions for kiteboarding for the whole year. Hopefully it'll be another year at the top. When I'm kite surfing, it's when you're just having fun, doing big jumps. You'll be riding along, wind in your ears, all the water spraying around, then you'll do a huge jump, and everything will go quiet. Just then you hit the water, and everything's like back hectic again. When I'm doing my freestyle move, you're not really concentrating on where you are, what you're doing. It's just you're concentrating on your body movement, you're actually concentrating so hard on the actual move you're doing that the time in the air just goes quick, you know? KRA holds numerous events around the world to determine the champion. At each event, riders face each other in one-on-one -on -one heats. Inside the marked competition area, they have seven minutes to pull off various tricks, such as mobs, S-spends, slim chances, and whirlies, each rider trying to outperform the other in order to advance to the next round. We always have an odd number of judges judging one heat. They have like seven criterias to to the height, who's going to be the winner, who's going to be the loser. But the final decision is always going to be an overall impression. They are not scoring the tricks separately. They only have an overall impression of what the rider did during the seven minute seat or the, whatever the situation was. The PKRA operates tournaments in a double elimination format, which means riders can lose twice before they are completely eliminated from a competition. 32 riders are seeded in the ladder of the single elimination round. As they lose, they are placed in the double elimination ladder. So if a rider loses in an early heat, this gives them a second chance to come back, possibly all the way to the final. And if that happens, they have to face the winner of the single elimination and beat them twice to win. Before a heat, depending on the person, I, I, I try to be relaxed as possible, go into it and start the, the, the heat off well, that's the key thing. I go into a competition making sure the first minute, two minutes, I don't crash, I land, I get my confidence up. Busted out quite a few things, so I'm pretty happy. Yeah, yeah I wasn't like it was pretty uh, nerve-wracking going into it. Actually, for some reason, I never really get that, but I kept it together. I think and really went for it, and hopefully, I think I think it's enough. So, should be good. <laughs> Aaron wins the event. It's a great start to the year.
now we're in Belgium. Um, first day of competing and it's pretty wet and miserable. Today's been a complete nightmare really. It's just been up and down. The wind comes with the clouds and then drops with the rain and this and that. It's been a lot of hanging around. Finally now they might get a few more heats in and finish the first round, so that would be cool. Okay, you know what's going on with the weather? It keeps changing every 10 minutes. But uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. The wind's at least here. And it looks like we're going to have an event, so whatever, they're going to get wet anyway. It's just us, isn't it, really? So look at the difference between this and Venezuela. It's mad. But that's what a world championship's about, isn't it? You go all over the world and you experience different conditions and different kind of wind strengths and different directions, different temperatures. And the guy that can deal with all of that and put it all into one bag and be the winner, then that's the guy that wins, I think. It's blowing 30, 30 plus. Yeah, it's going to be pretty hectic. So bad, so bad, like so gusty, and just super difficult to kite really. Trying all these, uh, all these powered moves and handle passes, and the kites are so quick and so powered up. But it's all good fun here. The judge's decision goes against Aaron. And this one was, I used five judges, that's five, and it was three to two. And it was four. So it wasn't obvious, for sure. What did he say? No? I told him, it's like everyone, I walked down the beach, everyone said that it was obvious, and he said, no, it wasn't obvious. I'm like, yeah, it's not obvious. All the guys, everybody said it. <laughs> Although he loses the heat, Aaron still has a chance to come back through the double elimination, but will have his work cut out for him. It's the end of a tough day. So yesterday I had a bit of a, well, a bit of a bad day already. I had a really good heat, but I didn't go through. I was, I was pretty happy coming off the water, so I thought I went through, but it didn't happen. So um, today, well, I ended up third yesterday, which is okay, but of course I always want to end up first. That's how, <laughs> how I want to finish. So today I get another chance, and the wind looks a bit lighter. Maybe I can pull off a few better tricks, and yeah, I just get to the final and beat Kevin off number one spot. Different size kites are used in different wind speeds. Faster winds require a smaller kite, while lighter winds need a larger kite to ensure consistent and controllable power. At every event, because you don't know what the wind's going to do throughout the day, it's just good to have every size rigged up. So usually I'd have three kites, seven and nine or 12, the three kites that I already use most. Especially here in Belgium, it can change so quick. Uh, just one cloud can make 50 knots or then it can die to 12 or something. So it's good to have everything rigged and just ready to go. He's got to win three rounds to be back in the final. And then to beat the guy that got the single elimination, Kevin, yesterday he has to beat him twice. So a bit of a tall order, but bring it on. So I'm up to third, just gonna go challenge second place. Sailing pretty well, everything feels good, so back up to first one. Aaron makes it to the 
double elimination final against Kevin Langery from Holland. To win the event, he has to beat him twice. After winning the first final, he immediately faces Kevin again. I had a good heat, I felt good the whole way through. Perfect on that, on my seven, so yeah, I just went off it. Hopefully that was it, I mean, if that didn't win, I don't know what to do, so <laughs> should be all good. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner is Aaron Hadler. After events in Portugal, the Dominican Republic, the Canary Islands, Germany, and Canada, by the penultimate event of the 2006 season, with Kevin Langry close behind, Aaron is still in first place and only needs one more victory to secure his third consecutive world championship. and examine the wind conditions to determine which size kite to use. He's, um, he's going to take the nine meter. Uh, we had a seven ready, but you're going to take the nine. It's a lot more, I think it's going to look, look a lot more powered up. It's quite, there's a lot less wind inside, so he's going to be more powered in, inside. He's pretty powered up. Uh, one hit. He's got Kevin Langry. It's going to be a good one, huh? Pretty strong gust coming through. Aaron's going to try and bust out some new stuff as well. So uh, we'll see. Fingers crossed. This is it, the big one. This is the place to nail it. Just want to clean, bang, done, one, one heat. Job, job done. Then we can all relax. He's pretty stressed out, to be honest. I haven't seen him like this for a while. But, uh, it's always tough when you've just got one heat, you know, and you sit there and you wait and you wait and you wait. He's been sailing for 20 minutes, he's, he's ripping, so I don't see a problem. fly. He's forced to swim back to shore. Luckily a friend has another kite ready to go. Despite all his efforts, Aaron loses the crucial heat. Pissed off, man. Like, uh, I can't believe it really. Like, because I was lost my kite, I was a bit downwind and a bit underpowered afterwards. Like, half that didn't count, and I lost the first round. And then um, the wind totally just went away, and I've got to wait till tomorrow to do the final, the final, final. And yeah, I'm just gonna go off and kill it. Yeah, it's just gonna be the finals today, the final final, and it's windy, windy, so I'm gonna go off.
good enough. Let's see what the judges say. He looks pretty happy. So, so turn. In these winds, it was so hard. Just went for it, man. Had to go 100% and yeah, I got it. <laughs> Aaron has won his third world championship in a row, an unprecedented accomplishment in the sport. To win it once is like an achievement. I was like just stoked with that and like I would never dream in my life that I'd be three times world champion throughout my whole life, let alone at 18. Although the title is his, Aaron won't be crowned champion until after the final event in Brazil. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to make kiteboarding history. He's not been the champion once. He's not been the champion twice. From the United Kingdom, the three-time world champion, Aaron Hadlow! For Aaron to be three times world champion is just, it's just incredible. I mean, I've been in the sport from day one. I was competing myself in the early days of kite surfing. The level is insane. And to hold your standings for three years in a row in a sport that is moving as fast as this and so progressive with so many young guys from all over the world is amazing. Everybody but everybody around the world would love to take Aaron off the top. And being in a freestyle judged sport, people can be very, very closely lined. So Aaron has to stay above that constantly. And now his ambition has become number four world champion, number five world champion, and he will go on like that. Yeah, I want to come back next year strong, man, and just make it four times. I think it's possible, so. Just gonna go train my ass off and go for it. I train by just going out and ride really. I mean, it's just practice, you know, that's all I that's all I do. I try and kite as much as possible and innovate as much as I can. Throughout the years I always come to South Africa. It's a, it's a hard wind, strong wind, difficult conditions. And, but once you nail it here, you go to a competition, you know you're going to do it. Just going out every day as kind as much as possible, pushing the sport. You gotta be innovative, you gotta make new stuff, try different things even if it seems impossible. And each time I've won a season is because of bringing something new into the into the competitions. now where I can make up tricks. I try to make up as many tricks and when you land that new trick what no one's ever done, you go out and you beat yourself up trying to do it and then you finally get this one trick landed. It's just like as good a feeling as anything, especially when it's something no one's ever done. So my main focus in kiteboarding is freestyle. Pushing the limits as much as possible and just innovating, making new stuff and bringing that to competition. But give me anything, I love to ride it, you know? Like I'll go out on a surfboard some days and just ride strapless in the waves on hook. Also just doing huge jumps. I'll go out on a ridiculous day and I'll love to just jump as high as possible. It's possible to go huge with, with the winds in South Africa, like the full 40, 40 knots plus. Then incorporating that with huge kite loops, I get like a huge rush just to fly through the air and try and do the biggest kite loop possible. I 
love like each aspect of the sport. There's so many different things you can do. Whatever it is, I'll enjoy it and try and push it to the next level. Kiting is full on, but I really enjoy to just get away from that and do something totally different. Like here in South Africa, it's the perfect example. Every day kiting, you get tiring, you know. It's still good fun, but you need to have your time out from it. That's why I like to go down the go kart track. It's something totally different, and it's really good fun. And uh, you're not even thinking about kite surfing, so when you come back, you're more motivated to go out. At the last event of the 2007 PKRA World Tour, after a long year, Aaron is again in first place and on the verge of winning his fourth world championship in a row. Again, close behind him, is Kevin Langery, who is undisputably Aaron's closest rival. Going into this last event, it is still possible for Kevin to win the championship and take it away from Aaron. Maybe I can win four events in a row, maybe not. I'd be pretty sick if I can. And yeah, hopefully Aaron drops one place. Yeah, hopefully I'll win, so we'll see. This event, I really need a good result to, to win the championship, so I'm just going to do what I've got to do to win, and yeah, let's uh, just see how that goes. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to going out there and just trying it out. The kickers look good, so I really enjoy that, and in between the waves, it's flat, so it should be cool, man. It's fucking cold, though. Every year I've been more independent and the first years I was with my parents, uh, a little bit with Jason um, and stuff like that. Last year I had a girlfriend for a bit and this year, you know, I've just been on my own, just travelling with friends and, and living the life and it's probably been one of the most fun, one of my most favourite years I've had. You know, I'm old enough now just to be doing my thing and I'm just enjoying what I'm doing and it's all good. At the end of the first day, Aaron and Kevin face each other in the single elimination final. Alright, here we have results from the final. Man's final. Here we go. 4 1 decision. Going to the number two in the world, Kevin Langray. After losing to Kevin, the championship is now up in the air and closer than ever going into the double elimination round. The next heat will decide it. So yeah, we're on the way to the beach and the event side, pimping it in this drop, and it looks like the freestyle's on, beginning of the double elimination, and uh, see how it goes. What do you need to do? I need to win, man. I'm gonna win. <laughs> Hope so. Announce their decision before Aaron comes off the water. You won, man. <laughs> Fuck, that's amazing, man. That was like, yeah, an amazing, just amazing thing, man. Four times world champion and win that last event. Well, I'm actually lost for words, man. That's crazy. Just absolutely destroyed right now. I mean, I did three heats in a row pretty much, and the water's absolutely freezing, but, uh, you know, it's all worth the energy, you know, and I put everything I had into it today. I think that was the only way to go, and just had nothing to lose, so I just went for it, and that was it, man. It was, yeah, it turned out great. <laughs>
Now I'm 19, four times world champion, you know, and I don't know, I'm just, it's really cool, you know, I'm at a great age, I think, and I'm at the peak of my sort of performance and career and stuff, and everything's just going so well at the minute. I'm having so much fun with everything and just living the life. And for now, I'm sort of done with the season, you know, I've been traveling a lot lately and it's been fun at each event, but at the same time, I still want to just be based somewhere, just chilling. And I think I'm going to go home to England for the rest of October, just chill there. Just if I don't kite, I don't kite. It's for me, I just need a little bit of a break. Um, I don't really know what I'm doing, you know, I, maybe competing next year probably ideally i'd love to come back and and win again um but it's only for so long you can go on you know and i just see take the moment and then whichever road i take i take and we'll see how it goes after deciding to go for a fifth championship and three events into the 2008 season aaron is again in the lead but Kevin remains his closest competition, and here in the DR, he has already won the single elimination round. Today's double, I've got to come up against uh, the next guy coming up, and then if I beat him, I'm going to go up against Kevin, hopefully a couple of times. Uh, feeling pretty good, the wind's strong, it's my, my sort of win, so I'm going to go for it. lines comes loose. His friends on the beach scramble to help him. Eventually they get another kite ready for him to use. drama behind him, Aaron can now focus on the next heat against Kevin. decision goes to Kevin. I couldn't have done much more. I was relaxed, doing all my shit. I didn't see him do much, but he... I don't know, man. Fuck it. That's how it is. Fuck sake, shit. Here in the world, in second place in the 2008 Millennium California World Cup, coming from England, Aaron Hadlow! Winning a competition is like one of the best feelings like you can get. Just being able to place yourself somewhere. You may be the best rider in the world, but you'll never know it unless you go up against other people and put yourself there. That's the reason I do it. Congratulations, guys! The style of kiteboarding is changing, especially my riding, but. Uh, yeah, they just need to understand, I guess. At the minute, it's still a bit more like the old ways, and it's just weird. But like with me and Kevin, Kevin really is pushing that side of the riding when he free rides and goes into competition with that sort of stuff. But for me, I'm like riding different when I free ride, and I want to bring that into competition. But if I did that, I doubt I'd like pass through the second round or something. So for me, I'm trying to do what I can, like make sure I've won the heat, and then the last couple of minutes try and bring things in. So, We'll see how it goes in the future. To come home, it's more like the holiday for me. 
I come back and I just totally relax. I've got no pressure to kite. If it's windy and it's good and my mates are out, I'll go out and ride with them. I just have to be near the sea, basically. I can't live without having half of my view in ocean and the other half in land. If I'm stuck with just land surrounding me, I sort of go crazy after a week, at least. Um, so generally, like, just down here, it's really cool because my two mates, two good mates live here. I can always have a place to crash and it's just fun to hang out. Um, plus, it's a really good spot for kiting. You know, I'm just here, totally relaxed, got no pressure and just do what I want for a little bit and then that just clears my mind for the next competition. The year isn't going that well. So I had a pretty good start to the season and did pretty well. Um, was in the lead for most of it. Got to the DR and um, came second place and that, that put us pretty much equal with Kevin Langry. Um, and then in the next event, I came second again in Tarifa, and so he took the, the first seed and then the lead for the championship. And like it's the first time I've been like seeded second since I first became like the seed seed one. So it was pretty mad to like to drop down, but that sort of gave me motivation to come back. The event of the 2008 PKRA season is once again in Chile. After dropping down into second place earlier in the year, Aaron has since reclaimed the lead, but still has to do well here to secure the championship. If he doesn't, it will go to Kevin. October 4th today, 20 years old, my birthday, so pretty cool day and uh, it's the start of the event in Chile, uh, Matanzas, and yeah, we'll see how it goes. It's a really important event because I've got to finish in the top four to clinch the fifth title. I haven't finished below second all year, so I hope that I can carry on with that. After some time away as Aaron's manager, Jason Finesse is back to help. Pretty much said to Jason and Flexiful that it's time, like Chile's going to be important, I, should, I need someone there. And on the beach, he's probably like more stressed than me half the time, but um, he's always got everything ready for me and you need that when it gets down to, to the wire like that. You need people around you that will motivate you and get you pumped up and, and ready to go and yeah, Jason's that person. I think I kind of fill a few of the gaps and just make, you know, just putting the pieces together, the puzzle. That's pretty much my job and has been ever since he's a kid. Obviously now he's older and wiser and there's less reason for me to be standing there holding his hand. But at the same time, when it comes down to a tough event, tough conditions, and also places like Chile, you know, it's not, not such an easy launch and land. Something goes wrong with one kite, with one bar, that can be the championship over. So I kind of stepped back in at the end of the year and sort of helped out with all of that. On his 20th birthday, Aaron wins his fifth consecutive world championship. It's just a big achievement, like, to win five times is incredible, you know, and when I was that little kid just dreaming about the, the first time and, yeah, it just never saw me here at that, that point, you know, I thought maybe I could do it. You know, I keep getting this championship and more and more people are hearing about me and there's being more and more mainstream media thrown around, but kiting is still so small, the money in it is ridiculous, really, for 
for the sport it is, but it's growing a lot and it's just where surfing started, when surfing started, so there's definitely a big future. It's only early days and I understand that and I think if I can keep with it, it's going to be good. More and more people are starting to understand who I am and what kite surfing is and I think that's the real big part of my goals is to grow the sport and especially in the right direction. If I'm riding good, feeling confident, well rested and not too much tra travelling ahead of me then it's possible that I'll go for a sixth title because I definitely have it in me, I can do it for sure. And if not, if I'm still just ready to relax for a bit, maybe take a year out, do other stuff and come back stronger.